from talking with David and his brother, y'all think you're going to be somewhere about 115 tons per acre? Oh, that would be awesome. Is that is that what no. you were thinking? <laughs> what, what did you say? No, about about 15 tons per acre. About 15 tons. Sorry, That's so. dry land irrigated everything correct uh, okay. together. Yeah. So we're, we'll cut that out so I don't look like a doofus. <laughs> uh, no. <laughs> now we got to leave all that stuff in. But no. Uh, so David, David said that dry <laughs> land, which is this, this is dry land, right? Good morning, guys. Cody and Erica at Bar 7 Ranch. Welcome to today's video. We got something pretty neat in store for you guys today. So come along with us and see if you can learn something. You're not gonna tell them what it is? No, this is to get this is the tension grabber. They gotta okay. tune into the rest right. of the video to see what's going on. Well, um, if you don't know what this month is, check out like think about what month it is, and that'll give you a hint at what Nobody we're doing. Nobody knows that. It's National Dairy Month. So Cody, that'll give you an spoiler. idea of maybe what's going on today. All right. Some years you don't make any hay and some, you know. I, I really like that video you meant. That's a great point. Not owning too much uh, metal, not owning too much metal. That yeah. is a common theme that, you know, my dad has taught us as well. You just don't need to have all this equipment and stuff because it all costs money and it all breaks. And right, and if it's something you use very little, yes. I mean, it doesn't make sense to have it tied up for. For the most part, we're, we're pretty good about that. Like our loaders will run and some of our tractors will run 20 hours a day. Right. So. Yeah, those obviously we oh, need them, right? Yeah. <laughs> Not good anymore. It's cow cow corn. Too dry. Too past. Too far past. Yeah, and so we're looking like at the milk line. So have you ever evaluated corn? Well, so I'm guessing not for silage either way. Right. So what we'll look at is we'll take this corn in the field, and we're getting about we're about a week to ten days off from harvest. And some of that's gonna depend on how dry it gets. Cause if we get some moisture, these kernels will fill up and become much fatter. Like they'll barely fit in here. Whereas, um, whereas right now they're just kind of small and if it doesn't rain, they're just gonna kind of shrink. And so one of the things we'll look at for making silage. So when we make silage, we're chopping this whole plant. We'll chop it all up into about one inch pieces, leaf, stalk, everything will go. And including the grain. And we'll also have a kernel processor that'll break every one of these grains up. Cause the outside of each grain kind of will would prevent a cow from digesting it, like that uh, seed shell or so. Right. So when we, to try to decide when it's time to harvest, we can grab a seed kernel and we'll squeeze it. And if it's still milky like that, it's gonna be too wet. If we put this up for silage, it's gonna be just running juice out. It's still too wet. So we need to go a little drier than that. Well, we're, what you're gonna look at, and, and that may depend a little bit, will be, is part of the stalk dried up? Cause then we'll get some dryness from there. But most importantly, and most of the moisture is right here in these kernels. So we're looking at this yellow line in here, and it's kind of hard to see, but you can almost see there's a yellow line right there. So right now we're probably at what we would call about 50% milk line or so. And I say 50%, that's not 50% of the way down, but on the bottom there's a, uh, I forget the name of it, but there's a, like a little stem in the middle that doesn't count. Okay. So the top fills a lot more, and then as you get to the bottom, it becomes less. And what we're going to look for is about about 75% or so uh, milk line. When that milk line gets down, so 75% of that starch has been added, that's when it's ready to harvest or you've added the most. And, um, and that's generally when your moisture content is going to be right as well. And so that's when we'll chop this stuff. So <clears throat> I don't know that, you know, we don't do much dairying in our area. And... Uh, but a lot of dairies do grow their own silage, right? Absolutely. Um, and you may, add, but they also feed whole corn or kernel corn that's already, you know, that's been combined. Ground corn or flakes. Yep. To the, to their cattle. But if you, so why, I guess let me ask you this. Why don't you take this to that point and then buy silage? What's, what's the difference there? Why? Okay. So the main difference is economics. When you're trying to put this up, it has a lot of water. So when we harvest this, it'll be sitting about um, about 60%, a little bit more of that, a little bit more, 65% of that is water. So we're trucking lots of water. So you want that feed to be close to the dairy. So you're not trucking a bunch of water for So distance. if you were getting that brought in on a rail car or something, number one, it'd be, it'd be probably impossible to move it by rail, but but you're paying for that water weight that's, and you pay by the pound when you're freighting stuff. So growing it here this way, chopping it, and then setting it up for the year. So can y'all, y'all can get by, y'all can grow enough to feed for the year on your. On a good year, like this year, we're, we're 
wet. We're not completely that wet. If there was more water on some of like our lakes for irrigation and such, we would uh, we would be able to maybe. This year we're still gonna have to buy a little bit from other farmers, um, other local farmers and such. And some can even get closer to, down to your area. You know, right. they're, they're not that far away. Right. And so um, so we'll we'll truck it in a little ways like that. But um, but yeah, ideally we could grow it all ourselves. But mother nature has to help us with that and right. last year being so dry there's no water stored up this is a gorgeous looking corn crop it's not perfect but it's gorgeous looking because of the rains we got this spring right. not no there was no soil moisture from last year hardly so something that that's different depending on what part of the country you're in um david says from talking to his brother so so there's three brothers involved with the dairy full-time right or all four of you are well there's yeah there's four of us and i guess three are full-time with us and one's at our uncle so he's also okay. in the dairy so all four are involved yes absolutely and, and kind of in y- y'all's family dynamic you know like you take care of more of the the, the livestock side the cow yes. barn one brother does most of the farming yep and the other brother handles the bottling company That's the correct. bottling side of it and distribution so yep. everybody kind of has their own specialty but from talking with david and his brother Y'all think you're going to be somewhere about 115 tons per acre? Oh, that would be awesome. Is that is that what no. you were thinking? <laughs> what, what did you say? No, about about 15 tons per acre. About 15 tons. Sorry, That's so. dry land irrigated everything correct uh, okay. together. Yeah. So uh, we'll cut that out so I don't look like a doofus. <laughs> uh, no. <laughs> now we got to leave all that stuff in. But no. Uh, so David, David said that dry <laughs> land, which is this, this is dry land we came. You're in. correct. This is all dry land. So this what dry land means is it's not irrigated. It's just whatever whatever God says He's going to dump on it is is all the moisture it gets. We're praying He blesses us with some today. Right. And uh, so if. So dry land, that's what dry land is, and then irrigated is, or wetland, uh, well, it's not wetland, irrigated. what do you call it? We yeah, just, just call irrigated, irrigated, irrigated corn. corn means it has a, an irrigation pivot that, that runs on it and waters it. So those two combined, obviously the, the irrigated is going to produce better than the dry land most of the time. Most of the um, time. When you combine that, about 15 tons per acre is what, what they're hoping to get their yield out of this year. So. so let me tell you something interesting about us. So I said 15 tons per acre. But what we'll do is, um, and that can that could be as high as 20 to, you know, average maybe. I don't think we'll hit 25 average for everything. That that would be asking too much. There will be certain fields that may hit that. But what we'll do is we'll turn our irrigated acreage around, and we will as soon as this gets harvested, we'll go right back in there and plant corn again. Okay. And so we'll plant corn right here at the first of July, 15th of July maybe, and then that will grow really fast. Like you plant it three days later, it sprouted, and we just water it a whole lot and that first part it'll grow you know if we get mother nature gives us a rain in july then it'll really go and so generally that one doesn't get nearly as tall but then it'll start maturing and putting its making its ears in the fall um september october we'll harvest about the end of october november and that'll look really different so what you'll see is like this kernel this this cob is tall it's long kind of not that fat but um, they can be a little fatter than this. Well, those fall ones will generally be a little shorter because they got stressed, may not have a perfect pollination if it was hot there at the end. But then when those kernels fill up, those seeds will be so fat and we'll get a much higher uh, like energy content per ton that we're putting up. So it's right. like two different crops. So we'll make another maybe 10 tons in the fall. So the acreage actually gives us maybe 25 tons average. Right, um, awesome. So that's kind of a unique thing that we get to do. Yeah, figured it out so some of you northern guys will be like man they're them guys are only gonna make 15 20 20 tons per acre but you got to realize that we're in central texas i mean it's, it's a way different scenario than what you guys are are experiencing up there you know we uh we toured a farm last year up in new york you know and their corn was just massive you know and it's and it's just like you know if, if they don't make 150 or 60 bushel corn you know, it's a disaster. It's a complete disaster, and I'm like, where we're at, you know, on dry land, co- I mean, dry land corn. If it don't, if it makes 75 or 80 bushels, that's a pretty good crop, you know. Yeah. And they're like, oh man, we couldn't even plant it for that. And it's, but it, it's just a big difference in, in where you're at in the in the in the state or the nation on on your production. So. Absolutely. All right, well, let's go see the cows. That's and that's the reason we rail in the the dry corn because they can right. grow up more efficiently up yeah, there. Yeah, more efficiently up there, and a lot more of it. And around here. When you're growing it around here, it's mainly for silage. That goes back to the, the same thing we talk about a lot about about finances and about, you know, just penciling stuff out. You may, you know, Dave and his brothers, may, they may want to grow all their own corn here, but if, it, if it's cheaper to buy just as good a corn and have it brought in, 
then it's a no-brainer to do that versus killing yourself trying to make something just so you can say you grew it yourself, so to speak. So, uh, correct. Yeah. Some and some people are just have different resources, right? Yep. Somebody else may have land and a little bit more fertile that's a little bit further away. So yeah, every, scenarios are different. Absolutely. Uh, awesome. All right. Let's go see some cows. You know, I got a pretty good coastal stand in here too. Do what? Yeah, I got a pretty good coastal stand in here too. Yeah, on the edges. The irrigated fields, we actually, we chop and, so we'll make silage out of the coastal too. Like all the stuff around the plant. Yeah. We just, just made like 6,000 tons of that. Just drive it, just get it too, huh? Just mow it and it goes all for silage too. We'll make some hay as well, but um, but then silage. And that, that makes really good feed obviously for the protein. And, but yeah, we do, we do the corners of the irrigated fields over there too. Coastals, almost all dry land. We have a couple irrigated fields of coastal. So do y'all mix so Just a little bit of history here. Um, so that would have been just us boys. Well, I guess, no, my wife's already in the picture because she was already, we were already married at that point. But this is back in 93. So in 93, you have an old milk and parlor, a house where the office now sits, and just three open corrals and like a fe little feeding area and such and raising the calves in the fields around it. And um, that's how my parents bought it and that's how they started. And was then, it a, was, was it an existing dairy that it, they bought? It was, yeah. Okay. It was an existing dairy that had been struggling and um, had changed hands once my parents came here. It actually was like built as like the largest dairy in the county or maybe even more at that time. It was one of the really big dairies were designed to be really big. They weren't, they never got there. It was always just struggling. Um, <clears throat> so then this is in 2003. Um, so Again, you have the old milk and parlor in the three shades there, those three pens. This is a really wet year, if you can't tell. And uh, they had built those free stalls just a couple years after getting here. They realized to dairy cows in Texas, it can be dry, but it can be really wet too. And then cows really suffer. So they built the barns for the cows and it helps with the heat too. And then we, and then in 03, they built the new milking parlor and they built two uh, longer barns and then added an, another barn the next year and we still had like we thought hey maybe some cows don't like the barns they want to be in an outside pen and such and they realized a year later that all the cows wanted to be in the barns <laughs> they all loved the bed so then they got rid of the outside pen and we built a barn there as well and you see kind of some of the feeding stuff that's come with it and we built a maternity barn there and then if you look at oh, where'd it go oh up here <laughs> and then um, and then in 2015 I believe we took that existing barns and we closed it up. We were trying to figure out because, you know, morning sun was shining in, evening sun was shining in, these cows would just be standing there just hot. And so we were like, man, how do we get the sun? Do we put curtains and more fans? And so instead of curtains, we, uh, we brought the roof down, closed the middle up and put the fans to suck the air through the barn. And in doing that, we got it to be shaded all day long. Uh, still let some natural light in. Um, so anyway, so we built that to cool the cows down and that's helped a lot. And it also helps keep flies out because flies hate that sucking of air. So we always think like put a fan on flies and they get out. Really, I have not found that. Like when we put fans on cows, or we have certain areas we just have fans on like our working areas, there's still flies all over the place. As soon as we start sucking air, from one day to another, the flies are gone. Hmm. And most importantly, the biting flies. Have you experienced those? Yes. And so your cows are like all piled up right. in the corner of the field because of them. Well, our cows would yeah. all pile up into the center of this barn and use like a quarter of their space when those flies come around. And the day we put the end wall on, so we have those fans, and the day we put the end wall on, they've never piled up again. Hmm. Like as soon as you start sucking air, they quit. We did the same in our parlor a couple years back. You'll see in a minute, we started sucking the air through there. And as soon as we did that from one year to another, the cows gave a gallon more per day hmm. that year versus the prior Pays year. Pays for some fans pretty quick, doesn't it? That, that absolutely paid for the, some fans really quick. So that was a huge benefit. You kind of see our feeding area and stuff's just kind of growing around it. And so you see our fields around it. So, Can you so here? on the far side, you see the cows wanting to come in. So cows want to be milked, right? It feels good. They like that feeling. So they will come in on the far side. And, um, and the first thing they'll do is their head will go into that board, read the uh, identification chip and identify her to that stall. So we know how much milk they gave every time they come in here. At the same time, right underneath there is a little spray arm that goes in and puts a sanitizer on their udder. And then there's a person that will wipe the teats clean. And then there is a person that will attach the milking machine. Then the cow will go around here about a little bit more than half the turn. She's busy milking. Depends on the cow and each one product, each one 
of their production. So one that finishes, as soon as she finishes, the flow rate drops, it will automatically take the milking machine off. And so you're seeing some here are done and some are still being milked. Then they'll go back around to the end when they're all done, it will put a sanitizer, the guy will put a sanitizer on them again, they get a shower bath again, and then they walk out. One of the first things, and they go back to their milking pen. One of the first things I want to point out, because it sticks out to me, I don't know if it does y'all, so ask questions, but you'll see the cows are wet. They almost maybe look a little dirty. They are just soaked. So it is hot out there, right? We've been out there enough to know it's hot. And a cow, a dairy cow producing milk gets heat stress starting about 68 degrees Fahrenheit. So she is, right now these days, always stressed. So we're putting that, that water on them just to cool them off. So a lot of stuff you'll see is all for cooling. The fans in here, the soaker water when they're waiting to get milked, a shower bath after they get milked, just lots of water to just cool the cows out is what we're doing. So I think one thing a lot of people probably don't realize um, is that cattle don't sweat. I mean, they'll perspire very minimally on their, on their nose, but as far as just sweating, they don't sweat. Correct. So they're only, and, and basically a cow is a huge furnace. I mean, their internal temperature is usually what, about 101 degrees, something like that is their normal. About, especially when they're producing milk, they make a lot more heat than a cow that isn't producing milk. And they're, they're, they're rumen where, you know, a cow has a four part stomach and, and where they're processing that feed and that, that grain and the stuff that they eat, it, it takes a lot of heat to process that. So keeping them cool is, is an advantage to them. It, it helps them to, to, to be able, a cow really cools off at night when temperatures get low and the wind starts to blow across them. And so keeping them cool is, is super important. Um, another question I had for you, because I'm sure we're gonna get it, it is, so on the tail heads of these cows, some of them have green, some of them have orange. Let the folks at home know kind of what that system is. Yeah, so we get that question all the time. And if I don't get that question, then I blame it on too many middle-aged people in the group and no young kids that are willing to ask because I know that's obviously something that has to be crossing people's mind. So when we put the color on the cow's tail, so I'll start with the color you don't see and that's blue. So when a cow gives birth, we put blue on there and we write the date she gave birth. So then we can keep a really close eye on her for the next 10 days. We'll check her temperature, just make sure she's staying healthy, she doesn't get a fever, right? Just like right. if a person gives birth, that's a sensitive time period. Then we will, um, after about two months, we'll switch that over to orange. Orange are cows where we're watching them cycle and, um, and cow cycles every 21 days. And one day in that 21 day cycle, she will be what we call in heat or an estrus. And, um, and the other cows will sense that as well especially the other ones that are in heat, and they will ride her. So they actually mount her, and mm -hmm. they will ride her all day long, and they will rub all that chalk off. And so we go by them every day and check the ones that are rubbed off, and those are the ones we will breed ourselves. So we'll actually artificially inseminate um, the cows, those. We do all artificial insemination. We don't do any, uh, no, any bulls here. So, so quick. So what it means by that is artificial insemination. Most of you probably know what that is, but it's, there's no live breeding going on on this dairy. Yeah. So for a lot of people that don't know what artificial insemination is, they think, oh, it's this big deal. Well, this is, uh, this is like the, the pipette that gets used. And so it is probably a 30 second process. And most of the time when we do a farm tour, people get to see it out there when, when, they're, when they're breeding. Cause it's just like, yeah, it, they don't realize that they're like, oh, he just bred a cow. Oh yeah. Because it's, it's so fast. It's, um, so what we do is we thaw the semen, you put it in, in the end here in a small straw, you pass the semen through the cow and then uh, the straw through the cow and then you just put the semen in and it's fast. The reason we do that is, is for several reasons. So one is um, because it, uh, it helps us control genetics. So if we had a bull here, we wouldn't know what his offspring would look like. They may make a bunch of cows with foot problems. They may make a bunch of cows that get sick more often or don't get very much milk. Like all of those things can, uh, can happen. And when, when we use semen, they can, um, they have tested that and we know what those offspring are gonna be like. So we can right. breed cows for a better, a better outcome. And it also helps prevent any inbreeding if you have the same bull or having to change bulls all the time. And bulls are really dangerous, especially dairy bulls happen to be more dangerous than beef bulls. Mm -hmm. I don't exactly know why, but um, they get more temperamental. So it helps. And, and keep in mind folks that a, you know, if you put a, a bull on a set of cows, a, a bull's only gonna cover about 20 to maybe 25 cows is what he can efficiently get bred. Whereas you take that same bull, you collect his semen, you can breed hundreds of cows with that same bull. So if he's got a bull that he really, really likes and, and that bull's daughters produce milk well and have a good temperament, he can breed 
hundreds of cows to that bull and he doesn't have the cost of that of maintaining that bull all the rest of the year i mean you can't just put him out there and leave him year round because he just you're having calves born all the time and i don't know if y'all if y'all are calving year all maybe yeah. y'all having calves born yeah so different from i guess the beef industry we we will want calves consistently throughout the year because cows give birth and then they really start producing milk and they'll produce milk for about a year after that every cow's different some can produce right. milk for two years but generally for a year a little bit less and then we'll breed them again and stop milking them. They'll go through our break time or off time where they'll go out to an outside pen that generally has access to pasture unless it's 105 degrees outside and they're just gonna get cooked out there. Mm -hmm. They don't wanna go out there anyways. Um, and then we will uh, bring them back and they'll calve and then that cycle repeats. So cows will have about about one calf per year. Right. One thing I, I, I was super glad that David brought up is and I don't know, will we be able to get over there where the, we can see the cows coming in and off the carousel? Can we get close enough to really see that? Or is this probably the best view we're going to get from here? This is the best view for the cows getting on. Is that what you were saying? Yes. So if we get any closer going on, we have paneling on the sides so the cows don't, they're not distracted by the stuff going on around okay, them. So. And I'm going to bring it up right now since you, you were talking about the calves and such. All our calves that we raise get milk from our farm here. So people are always like, oh, the calves need that milk. Well, they do, they get that milk. Yeah. But a dairy cow produces so much more milk. They can produce eight to 10 gallons a day. And so a calf doesn't drink eight to 10 gallons a day. Right. So when we, uh, we've had you know other beef ranchers come and want some milk for their calves if they need them or such. And if you put a dairy cow and started getting calves to nurse, they put like three calves under a dairy right. cow to nurse. Yeah, a lot, of, a lot of guys have what they call nurse cows. So they'll get an old retired dairy cow or you know just go buy a Jersey or a Holstein cow at the cell barn and put four calves on her, you know, and, and let her raise four beef calves either for butcher or to go back into their herd so and that's not right. even one producing much milk so right. the one producing a lot of milk it's just they produce so much more than than yeah than the they're just super meat. efficient yep all right what's the difference in red and blinking red? so blinking red is the computer thinking that cow is not done milking and you can look at that cow and there's no more milk left in that other so the computer is just wrong <laughs> fairly oh. fairly lackluster uh, exciting thing but <laughs> But Sorry that's its intention. It's like it would think if a machine fell down and she abruptly stopped milking, it would say, oh, this cow fell, the machine fell off, she's not done. But some cows are milking fast and they, boom, they just done. And so it tricks the computer. So uh, next question, what's the average milkable lifespan of a, say a Holstein? These are Holstein cows that we're looking at right now. Y'all also milk jerseys or only Holsteins? Only Holsteins. Okay. But we get that question a lot. So what's the lifespan of a dairy cow kind of and such? And I'll tell you that's uh, let me give it a little bit more because um, just the number would, would be confusing, I guess. So two years raising a cow before she ever gives birth the first time. So we've right. spent two years raising this animal. She gives birth the first time we start milking her. She will have about one calf every year. And if you took the average of the farm, the average of the farm would be three calves, so about five years old. Okay. okay. We also have cows here that are 12 years old, that have had 10 calves or something like that, or nine years old, or nine calves. So the average is not a great number because some will calve and the first time they start giving milk, they never give much milk. So we're not gonna breed her back. She's gonna milk out and then we'll sell her for beef. So, gotcha. right, so an average isn't a great number. Some cows go really long and some cows can be really short. One thing that David told us is, is that this is a 72 cow carousel. So we can see on the bottoms here, the numbers. So this is a, well, let's get over here. Can you tell how the udders look different over here already? To us, they look a lot prettier over here than they did on the other side. Now don't film the dirty cow. Now every once in a while I got one that doesn't lay in the beds. So 72 cows, right? Here it says 72 stalls, yep. Yeah. See how you can't really see cows coming in over here? Right, I didn't know if you could see them. If we get on the steps, yeah. we can maybe see, but it's just not a good view, right? Right. So then all the milk will come over here. Anybody that's really cold right now, you can warm your hands up right here for a second. 
So this is the body temperature of milk coming yep. up. So about 100 degrees. So that's a nice warm milk. And what it's going through right here is filters, like a really fine filter. So this is what it looks like. We use the same filters to filter sand out of our water, just to okay. put it in perspective. Then it'll come through here and it'll go through our heat exchanger, just like the pasteurizer at the bottling, except this one's actually running. So you got milk coming in from right here, so you still feel the warm. And then it comes out right here. So feel the warm one, and then come back over here and feel the cold one. Wow, that's a pretty big draw. <laughs> when you use the same hand, it gives that shock. You know, you use different hands. Yeah. When you use the same hand, people are like, oh, dang. <laughs> like at first it like scares them, it's so cold, right? So that milk right now is uh, coming through at 35 degrees. So we go from 101 to 35 just going through here. And What's the freezing point in milk? 32. Same water. Same. So we're trying to sit right above that freezing point. So you'll see here a, di a divide in this, uh, in this heat exchanger. So the divide in here, the first part is our well water. So our well water runs through here, and this is our well water temperature. So you'll feel that's, what is that, 60 degrees? Probably, yeah. Something like that. Our well water is pretty warm here, actually. And so it'll go through, and it'll come back out pretty close to 75 or so wow. degrees. And by doing that, we've taken a big drop of that heat off that milk from 101 down to 70 degrees. And then we have our chilled water, so our, our glycol or such, that goes through the other half and it drops it down all the way to 35. Those compressors that cool that, that glycol, um, that, that heat off those compressors, we can then reuse to make hot water. That then washes everything again. Those compressors make heat and gas, and, and in turn we heat our water back up to 160 degrees with that. Awesome. So that's kind of a, a cool recycled uh, story we have. It'll go into one of our three tanks that we have here. Each one of these holds about uh, about 5,000, 6,000 gallons. No, 6,000 gallons. That one actually holds 10. And then, um, and then we will fill one up, go to the next one, and then this one will get loaded out, washed, and we'll repeat. So we just cycle between all three. Make about seven to eight loads of milk every day. So there's constantly trucks coming in and out and correct hauling hauling off mill. Yes. So that's the manure tanker that sucks all the manure up. So if you're going to go back out the door, you may see it. It uh, it has it's just like a big vacuum cleaner. So a tractor and a scraper, and that one's not very pretty. Um, but it vacuums up all the manure from uh, from the pens. So every time the cows go out, we vacuum it all up. So then the the pens will look like this. So they look pretty much clean. And those are the cows we just saw getting milked. So they've come out of the parlor and they've walked right over here. Like those are literally the ones you were just filming in there. So how often do y'all clean out the stall area? This, so that stall will generally clean itself. So the cow lays and she'll poop right over the edge. But the guy who takes them out to get milked will go rake anything that does fall on the end off. So he just walks with a little, just a little rake. And there, it into the I mean floor. the whole, whole pen, there may be five or 10 patties that may have fell on the edge. Just because I guess it, y'all, whoever designed all this said Correct. the average cow's this long, we're gonna give her just enough room to. Precisely, so they, those stalls are designed just like that. We can see here in a minute. So then they come back, these were the ones that just came back from getting milk right before those 10. So these are coming back, they'll have fresh feed. Those are about to get their feed delivered. I just saw him driving by, so he's gonna make a loop and come in here and dump it. And uh, they'll get their fresh feed put out in the mornings. They'll get more feed added in the afternoon and they're just all coming coming back to their buffet. So this is all, like, like we talked about earlier, guys. So this is corn silage. So it, those corn stalks that we looked at in the field with That's David. Like, this is like the husk, and you've got pieces like here, or some of the, that's the stem. Well, no, that's husk too. Like this would be part of the leaf material or stem of the corn silage. And then there's some, some cracked corn in there, and I'm sure there's some other commodities that yeah. you guys this mix is, in there. This is like uh, Bermuda grass. So this is like the grass that we saw around the milk bottling plant. And then you have, this is the corn from the silage. So that's what the grain looks like when it's processed. It's smashed and open, so it's available to the cows. And now then this you have is, alfalfa hay is the green stuff, a little bit of that. So this has a, it's, it's, it's damp, but not wet. I mean, you can't squeeze water moisture out of it. 
it doesn't hold together. It's not even wet enough to really hold together. It right. may a little bit, but it should kind of fall apart. But that's all. Na that's just the moisture that's in the solid, right? Y'all don't add. Do y'all add any we water? We do add to some water. Or we add, add water depending on the moisture of the silage to so knock the, the dust out of. Yeah, it. like some years that silage may get put up a little too dry, and then we need to add more water. Other years it may be right. And we don't have to add any water. So depends on how long Mother Nature gives us to harvest. Smells good. So it's, it's like a big casserole for the cows is what it really is, right? We've mixed everything in there and a nutritionist has formulated it. So a little bit of cotton seed or cotton, cotton seed hulls? Those are burrs. burrs. So what we call the burrs, so like the outside of the plant material and such. Then we also feed cotton seed. But we'll get to see all the ingredients when we go to the feeding area in a little bit. So do you have to warm them to shower, I mean, uh, flush brown? Great question. So worming, we would do if they're out on pasture. Right. Fly spring, we actually do nothing in this whole barn for fly control. Wow. Like, I'm not exact, like we'll put out fly bait, like, you know that I'll poison that. that you put out that the flies eat and die? We put that out for the outside cows, it. but we don't do anything in here for fly control. So, David, these, mis like these misters just went off, do they, yeah. is that something that's automated once they stand there long enough it comes on, or does that just turns on? They're on a timer and it's automated based on temperature. So okay. when we hit the 70 degrees or 68 degrees, they will start coming on, maybe like one minute out of every eight. And then when it gets over at 80, 85 degrees, they'll be on one minute out of every four. Awesome. So they're just all the time. And the idea there is you're soaking a cow and then you're evaporating the water off. So it's the same feeling as like when you get into a swimming pool, you think, oh, that's cool, right? But when you get out and the wind's blowing, then it really feels cold. Right. Unless it's a thousand degrees outside. But even then, it still kind of feels good. So that's what we're doing. We're trying to soak her and then evaporate it off. Soak her and then evaporate it off. So they just awesome. walk back over here by themselves? Yep. Yeah, they walk back over and like they know, like, hey, I'm about to get fed. And they're standing there waiting. Do y'all close the gate after? Y'all get everybody done or that you just leave it open and they know when to go back? We milk groups at a time. So they're in groups of like 300. So we'll bring a group in. Well, most of them will walk in by themselves. We'll bring the last couple in. We'll close the gate and then you know, set the gate for the for the next pen to start walking in by themselves, and the same on the way out. So they brought the last cow to this pen out, closed the gate, opened this, so now these cows are coming back by themselves. So most of the cows, about 90% of the cows were, are just moving kind of by themselves as we open and close gates, and then the so last 10% the we push. Closed when either all of them are in here or all of them are out. Correct, well, yeah. But they're almost always all in here, right? They only get milk for about an hour a day or so. So how do they let their self out, the ones that, once it latches? So in the mornings, they're set to latch so we can go check them. So it organizes them. You'll notice they're not all locked. They're still a bunch loose. But um, but then we will come through and we'll just, so like right now, they're latched and you could let one cow go like that by flipping the lever. But then we will come through when they're done, they're just going to take this and turn it up and now they don't latch anymore. So 99% of the time they're like this, but right after the morning milking, they just, we put them down. I don't want to create a, a mess for them, but I could let those go and then I could lock them again. There wouldn't be a cow backing out. They just got back. They want to eat. They're going to hang out here for 30 minutes either but way. But what's the purpose of them locking themselves in so you can come by and check them? Correct. So we can go behind them, put the chalk on them, um, breed them, so we can also give them any vaccines they need or any... Um, so you do all your breeding sequence. in here like this? Yes, just... everything's in here. Yeah, absolutely. And like a cow that's in heat, so one that needs to be bred today, if she's not locked up, you see, if you look down the lane, right, there's there's a whole set that aren't locked up, right? There's right. A, a good 20, 30 cows that aren't locked up. They just don't want to right now. If if that's one that we need to breed, you can still breed her right there. She'll walk in the stall like this one and you'll breed her. She wants to be bred. She will just stand there. I guess, and they've been handled so much from the time they were basically bottle raised or bucket raised on them. I mean, they're, they're, they're not kicking and fighting like a lot of like beef type cows would Correct. be doing you because they're... They, they know, handled so much. They know the routine. So give me one second. So this is like not our tame cow, but let's, we have some pet cows, but let's see if this one is, uh, so she's a little nervous, right? But this is like their favorite spot to be pet. She's still back to chewing her food. She's a little nervous. Why are there three people looking at me? But if you catch a cow that's loose and you go to touch it, like scratching them right here, They'll just be like, oh, that feels good. And they just stop. That's one of their itchy spots. So see how I can touch them and they're a little nervous, but they're not scared. Like they know we don't 
didn't hurt them, right? And that's a good way to evaluate a farm. If you ever get to a farm and the cows are scared, like you show up and all the cows run away, not a beef farm because it's different, yeah. right? But on a dairy farm, um, it's either two things. Either they never work those cows, so is there something unique about that? Or they may be mistreated because right. cows should not be just running away from people. So I know people are gonna, you know, water conservation, commodity, all, all that kind of stuff is a big deal. So, you know, I know we're gonna get some questions or some comments. Okay, well, you're, you're using all this water, mm -hmm. but you know, isn't that kind of wasteful? Isn't there a better way? But I'm assuming this water is gonna, like you said, it's gonna get sucked out. It's gonna be used as fertilizer or top dressing on your, on your crops or in your pastures. But do you have any other kind of water filtration? I mean, does this go down and filter and get just yeah. continue to be recycled or? So everything on the farm that manure touches, that whole area has to get caught in our lagoons, in our ponds. Okay. So the vacuum you saw, um, it vacuums up the manure with some liquid and it'll go out to a field, either in a pond and then to a field later or straight out to a field. But all the liquid manure that's running out the other end of the barn, that also gets caught in that pond, and that will all get irrigated. So the corn you see around here is all irrigated with that water. So it's not just a one and done, guys. It's, no. it's being used on other places on the farm to keep it as, for lack of a better term, as eco-friendly as we can be with the environment. Absolutely. Because with, yeah. I think farmers and ranchers get a bad rap a lot of times, like they're trying to kill the environment. And they don't, but the environment is what produces everything that we need to produce the commodities that you guys need so making sure that we take care of of the land and, and the, our surrounding and the environment around us is is the top priority for any farmer ranch if they want to continue to, to operate i would yep yeah so he just let those go so he so he just bred a cow while we were here talking i'm sure he did because that's why they were locked and then he came and let them go so as we were here talking, he just bred a cow. It was that fast. He just walked up, bred a cow, and walked back out. What about, have we talked about the bedding, about like the sand? Like how often? I don't, I don't think we, we have talked about that yet. So, um, so we, we use sand from our fields, and we will uh, put it out twice, add it in there twice a week. But for the most part, it just, it's like sand on the beach. So these cows can just lay on this sand. It's nice and cool. Um, it stays in there. It stays clean because the cows where they, when they lay down, their butts hang over the edge, and you don't get that uh, you don't get that manure in the bedding. Sand is inorganic, so it doesn't grow bacteria, so it's really healthy for their udders as well. So just a lot of nice things uh, about sand and, and their bedding. It's really soft on their feet, and it helps them give traction. So a little bit of sand they do scrape out makes the makes concrete not slippery and such. So it, it's really our preferred uh, bedding. So the way that locks is when they put their head down. To eat it closes it like theirs. Yep. yep. When they put their head right here, they'll go down to eat and it will naturally latch up there. And then when they you know come back up, they can still come up and down, but they can't get out anymore. Now the hole's not quite big enough to get out. Right. And so yeah, they're latched. And then we can, like I said, manually let them go, or like you said, he changes that handle and then brink, and you Let's see they're still it. about 25% eating and the rest are going to lay down now. They've they're done. So like like David was telling us guys, they re released this row of cows so that they can all, and what I wanted to show you or tell you about is the fact that they get as much to eat as they want. It's not just like, oh, here's you one helping, you know. These cows can eat as much as they want, right? I mean. Yes, absolutely. So we want them to eat a lot, right? That's, that's what makes milk production. Right, so I assume probably some at some point between the the time they get they get fed right now and and when they go back to the milking parlor they're going to come by and push this back over because you see some of these cows are going to they're going to nudge it out and push it over so somebody will come through with something and push it back over against the about every two hours we push it right back up there again and then they just keep eating so will they will they clean it up completely by the time they go we always have some leftovers part? every morning that we will push out and we'll maybe reuse again um, but yes, they will eat almost everything. You see how she's digging in there? You know, if it was up to the cows, if you let them go in our feeding area, they would all just go to the grain. She's just right. trying to get that grain out of there, right? But we put the forages in there and add that moisture, and the forages is most of the diet, because we want her to stay healthy. Now, cow, 
It's probably like a kid, right? If we had the choice to just eat a bunch of candy and then they get sick and wonder why they're sick, well, the cow's kind of the same way. She would just eat all the grain and then wonder why her stomach hurts later. So we're, it's in the dairyman's interest to feed the cow so that she stays healthy all the time. So Clance brought up a question. Why does this, this cow have a red Great question. band so, on her ear tag? So when a cow is pregnant with twins, we will put those red clips on their ear tags so we can identify her all the time. So a cow with twins gets treated differently all throughout. So we'll stop milking her earlier. We will bring her to our maternity area earlier because she's gonna have her baby earlier than the normal cow. Just like humans, when they have twins, they're generally deliver earlier, the same with cows. They will generally deliver a week or two earlier, maybe three weeks earlier, so everything's gonna happen earlier with that cow. It's programmed that way, but we also put the twins clips in so we can see it. And so in the maternity area, when she gives birth, we know, oh, there's a second one coming. We gotta go look for it. Gotcha. So after they get done eating, Yep. Yeah, the gate's only closed so the guy doesn't have to walk down two lines, so he can just walk down and see every cow one time. Right. So does this whole bunch of cows get this other side, or is there some? Yes. Nope. That's those cows get both sides. That's okay. their whole group. But you only okay. I, so right it. now, when they come back, we want them to eat and we want them to be on one lane. So we we close the gates so we can walk down, and then breed, and then. Uh, and then when we're done, we'll come back and do the other thing. So when, when this group of cows goes in, is there, is there a lead cow that's always the first one in every, I mean, it's one or two? It's fairly consistently, yeah. There is cow, like they have their own hierarchical structure and the first cows getting milked are always the first ones getting milked. The last ones getting milked are generally the last ones. The cow that hangs, up on, hangs out on this upper end of the pen is always on the upper end of the pen. Do they ever get, I get do they get to nerd, get to, the colostrum or do they get pulled off they, almost uh, immediately so sh so that's a this is a prime example so this cow just gave birth maybe 10 20 minutes ago right cow licks the calf dry and then we will uh bring the mom in here like that one and he's going to milk the colostrum out and bring the calf into here and feed the colostrum to the calf all within ideally that calf gets its colostrum within 30 minutes to an hour of birth but you just tube it uh, we bottle feed it, bottle not tube it. it. Okay. Yeah. And so all the cows around here, they're going to give birth in the next two to three weeks. So he's walking them every day, checking them and everything. Average. Calves per day varies throughout the year some because in the summer it's harder to get cows pregnant, so we'll have less in the spring. But, um, but for the most part, it can go any from as low as like maybe 10 a day to up to 50 a day with an average of about 20 to 30 a day being born. So is that his is that his routine when he sees one getting close he pushes her in here as soon as they start it's supposed to wait until they start calving so you start seeing the feet she's having contractions and then brings her in here if you bring them in too early like but when you think they're going to calve in the next day they'll delay calving for another day or two sometimes but if you put them in here when they start calving then they're not worried about anything else they get to be in here by themselves or with very little other distractions calve on a whole sand pack so why, why, what's the, why don't you ever let the calf nurse naturally? Because we don't let the calf nurse naturally because we don't know how much she's going to have consumed. And we want to guarantee that calf got its cloth. Gets everything So we needs. bottle feed them and if they don't drink them, we tube them, which is almost never, but we take the time to bottle feed them. If she nursed, every calf's different. Some may nurse and get it all, some may not. And that cow will produce more colostrum than one calf will drink again. So we will feed that colostrum to the calves for their second and third feedings as well. So calves will get two or three feedings. Make sure colostrum. they really get, yes. get it good. That's awesome. So do you like all our Angus calves? I do. You think that could pass off as a full blood Angus? I tell you what I think you need to do. I think you need to get, get 44 farm stuff and you could probably sell them back to 44 farms. But I think they just gotta be black and these will, all, no. Every black calf in here, even that one with the little foot in white, yeah. they will all grade certified Angus beef, which yeah, I'm sure you probably there know. Not, there ain't that much to the... Their certified Angus beef is only like 90-something percent black. Well, they're all 90-something percent black. Right. Every once in a while you get a little white showing, but most of them are completely black. So where do you go with them? They get picked up every day as well. They'll go through a calf raiser, and then they go to essentially feedlots in the Great Plains. So, so your calf raiser, somebody takes them and, and just bottles them till they're... Not bottles. I mean, they have those big. So we deals with. we sell these to a guy out of Kansas who has a feedlot. He contracts out with calf ranches to raise it. 
So the square bales here, alfalfa hay, that we don't grow. We uh, buy that. Obviously protein and fiber um, just takes too much water that we just don't really have here. And no cool nights. The round bales are straw. That's coming off of local fields. People that are making small grains will send a baler in after behind them and behind the combines. And we're doing that right now. And we're just baling up straw behind the combines. So if y'all know of any of that, we'll always- Wheat, uh, wheat and oat straw doesn't, matter, doesn't make you any difference? Correct. The oat may need to dry a little bit, but the wheat generally we're baling right behind the, the combine. Um, yeah, some more square bales. So we're always we're always kind of looking for local stuff like that. To that's a just a cheap fiber source, and that's good for like our dry cows that we're not milking because they have so much. They want to eat a lot still because they have that big stomach, but we don't want to make them fat. So if we fed them the same milk cow diet, they would just get obese in like two weeks. It would just go so fast. And so we're trying to feed them things like straw. So this is corn silage. So this is our own corn silage from. Um, hold on, give me a second. From last year in the fall. So this is what our second crop corn silage will be. And so you'll see a lot of grain in there, like a lot of powder stuff and a lot mm -hmm. of grain particles. And if you feel it and you rub it in your hand for a minute, then your hands get really soft. Yeah. Natural lotion right there, ladies. You I should. bring every tour and they absolutely love that. I'm like, hey, it smells a little sour, but if you, um, you rub, it's not a bad smell necessarily, but you rub your hands in that, they get so soft instantly. Instantly. So that's you, you the corn in that there that's doing that. You make on milk. Probably, yeah. So this is the grass silage. So this is the, the Bermuda grass. So after it goes through the silage process, it comes back out brown. So kind of like the corn is a little bit brown too when it comes out. So it goes through a fermentation and then uh, kind of preserves itself. So that's the grass. Then there's the leftover feed from the cows, that little pile, and then uh, sorghum silage. We do some sorghum as well. Then so that the leftover feed, you'll just mix a couple of scoops of that in with the fresh stuff and send it on send it back in sometimes we'll do that or sometimes we'll take a little bit of that we'll feed most of that to our non-milking cows that's like their their grain portion they'll get that gotcha. some straw and some sorghum silage just to kind of fill them up and that's that will feed out there um then you have our grains here on the far end we had uh we have soy plus which is uh like a soybean meal that's been cooked and it goes through a different fermentation so it helps more in the hind gut versus the front then you have dry distillers grains, which from ethanol or beer or, um, or when they make liquor. So the grains still have energy in them and protein so we can feed that to the cows. Then we have two bays of flake corn. We have two because we want to alternate because flake corn is, it's some people call it like a, a high moisture flake corn or such. And it actually has moisture in it. So, um, or steam flakes is what they call them. That's what I was looking for. So it still has moisture in it. So if you left it in the back all the time, it would mold. So we're always trying to alternate stuff there. And that's just like cornflakes at the grocery store, except without the frosting and, um, and uh, not sweet corn. Then you have cotton seed. We feed a decent amount of cotton seed. It's really unique in that it provides fiber, energy, and protein. It can, it can provide all the... Uh, almost a complete feed in itself. Almost a complete feed in itself, correct. Um, so it's unique and we grow a lot of cotton in Texas. Here you just have ground soybeans, so soybean meal. And then a mineral, so vitamins and minerals for cows just like people. This is our ground corn, uh, so just like cornmeal. Uh, you know, I've been looking this year and I haven't seen many bees in here, but a lot of times you'll see a bunch of honeybees yeah. in here. Huh. And I don't know why there are not that many in there right now. Maybe that's a set of them up there if that's flies, but generally you'll see honeybees buzzing around. And I've seen a lot of honeybees like in the parking lot where, my tr where we park right there. I've seen a whole bunch of them there sometimes, but I haven't seen them in the corn like I normally do. This is our alfalfa hay. So do y'all bring the squares down here and bust them and? That's correct. So that we, so everything on here is dosed within 10 pounds or 20 pounds. Right. So if you think of, he's mixing a load, every load that he mixes in that mixer, that, that'll be back in a minute, makes 30,000 pounds of feed and he's adding 12 ingredients and each one of those ingredients is within 10 pounds of error. So that's, when you're taking a whole bucket and that whole bucket holds three to 5,000 pounds and you're trying to get it down to 10, yeah, it, it requires skill. So you'll see him here in a minute. Um, and that mixer is like a giant KitchenAid mixer. So it's just a big, like a bowl with two screws inside that stir it and cut it up. And you'll, you'll see, and it'll prompt him. It'll say, hey, add 2,000 pounds alfalfa hay. And it'll count down as he's adding until it gets to zero. So we can monitor the error.
And then this is just the water to knock the And then the he backs up and it adds water in. Yep. Fancier than your feed huh? wagon. A little fancier than your old Yeah, it was a little fancier than the feed wagon I ran for a few years. But it's the same concept. I mean, we the preconditioning yard I worked in out of college, while well, I was in high school and in, in college and out of college, we ran basically Oswald mixing beds all on trucks, you know, not. Uh -huh. But our trucks held 10,000 pounds. They weren't near as big as this. But This will hold, depends on the feed, about 30,000. Um, it really only makes about 25,000 of our milk cow feed. If we made a concentrated grain mix, it could hold a whole lot more. Some of that See, really that, bulky feeds, we use less. So. That's something we didn't have. I mean, I, I knew what my ration was. I knew how many pounds of each commodity I was supposed to put in there. But that's pretty awesome. I mean, almost. Do you have like a feed sheet that you went off? I need to add so many pounds of this and this and well, this. I just, and this I mean, we just equal? mixed one, rat, one to two rations. So I just oh. knew, you know, I want to put 6,000 pounds of corn, 3,000 pounds of DDG, and 1,000 pounds of cottonseed birds in this, you know, okay, and, yeah, yeah. and I'm going to go up there and put 200 pounds of water on it or something like that. Right. You know? So he's he's mixing the feed for the cows that are about to, the ones that are going to give birth next. So it has eight ingredients, one of eight. The first ingredient is straw, so our fiber sort. So it's going to ask for 480, 40, 490 pounds, right? There's a little bit of bounce in the scale. And so you'll watch as he adds it, it'll just, he'll just dibble it in there and then he'll do each ingredient. So this is our purchase corn silage from last year. And if you look in this, you won't see hardly any grain. There's grain in there, but not nearly as much as that other one, right? So this is what costs us a lot more money out of a drought. So when we grow corn silage or we buy it, and there's not much grain in it, that has to be substituted with the ground corn and the flake corn. That's why we have, you know, have to have those ingredients. Ideally, it would all be in the fiber portion together, but it just doesn't work that way. So like where I worked is, a, you know, from the time I was about probably 15 or 16, like we we got in whole corn we cracked it ourselves and and did all that so do y'all buy in truckloads or do y'all y'all have a cracker or you know everything here on the grain side we buy in truckloads so it just comes in a live bottom truck and just back in there and dump, pushes it out that's correct he's on camera he's getting nervous now <laughs> Oh, is that I a video? So. Yeah. I guess what I mean is anything. Y'all are like, show? we need lunch. See, I told you it was going to be. Uh... <laughs> I'm not going to get lunch forever because now we got to go take cows and there's no lunch places in We between. might could go to Pretty and see yeah. if that. Y'all want to come back to the house and get some? No. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to have milk. Pumpkin. Gustine has a little restaurant, the city cafe. Oh, yeah. yeah. All right, guys, that wraps up our tour of the dairy farm. It was super fun. I hope you learned something about dairy, the dairy industry for Dairy Month. Absolutely, and if you're if you're in the Texas area or you're passing through, check out. Just stop at some gas stations. Kind of let them know. I mean, yeah, some H E B, some Brookshire Brothers, Brookshire Brothers, Brookshire's, um, United Market Street here in Texas. If and most importantly, because I can't name every mom and pop store, but if you get on our website at volumensdairy.com, there is a stores tab. You click on that, it'll show a map of all the stores that carry our milk. There's a lot of great mom and pop stores here in uh, in Texas that are carrying our milk and, and support them because yep. and support them out, and support these guys. And be sure and check out Bowens on their social channels. You yep. have Instagram, Facebook, you have you have TikTok. TikTok. Every you YouTube, 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 YouTube stuff? I think we may have a small YouTube, but mainly it's Facebook and, and Instagram. Okay. So check them out there at Bowman's Dairy. Yep, Volman's there. We'll link it all down below. So we're gonna keep ranching and they're gonna keep milking. See y'all later. Keep dairy farming. There you go. <laughs> <laughs>